I am so thrilled to introduce Thomas King. He is an award-winning novelist, author of short stories, scriptwriter, photographer, and essayist. His acclaimed best-selling works include Medicine River, Truth and Bright Water, A Short History of Indians in Canada, and The Inconvenient Indian. In addition to its many award distinctions, Green Grass Running Water was named to Quill and Choir's Best Canadian Fiction of the Century list. A member of the Order of Canada and the recipient of an award from the National Abor Aboriginal Foundation, King is a retired professor of English at the University of Guelph in Ontario. At WordFest, he's presenting The Back of the Turtle, his first literary novel in 15 years, and has also been shortlisted for a Governor General's Award. So please help me in welcoming Thomas King. I can't see you, but I know you're out there. <laughs> so I thought I'd open up the uh, evening with a harmonica solo. Okay, end of solo. <laughs> what I wanted to do tonight was to read two sections of the back of the turtle. One is the opening chapter. This is just a uh, uh, a bold attempt to get you interested in the novel so that you go out and buy, you know, four or five dozen copies for Christmas. <laughs> and then a second section that deals with one of the characters, a man named Nicholas Crisp. The novel itself um, is uh, set on the west coast of British Columbia. I suppose British Columbia does not have an east coast. <laughs> yeah. And it's set in a, uh, a fictional town called Samaritan Bay, which is right next door to a native reserve called the Smoke River Reserve. And there's been an uh, environmental disaster that's overtaken that area. It's destroyed the town, it destroyed the reserve, and all that's left of the town now are just a few survivors who still live there and are trying to put the thing back together again. There was a turtle rookery in the area too, and that was wiped out by this disaster. And the man in part responsible for that is a man named Gabriel Quinn. Quinn is an Aboriginal man. And at the beginning of the novel, he comes out to Samaritan Bay to look at the damage that he has had a hand in, and uh, ostensibly to try to commit suicide uh, out in the ocean. Um, well, I'll stop it there and I'll read you the opening chapter. The man stood at the boundary of the beach in the shadow of the hanging cedars and listened to the heavy surf run in from deeper water. The beach pitched up sharply here, the high sand soft and dry. Further down, the shore was firm and wet and footprints vanished with each step. He didn't hear the dog until it came bursting out of the ferns and the underbrush. It raced past him, cut a wide arc in the sand and seagrass, and galloped back, snorting and trembling. There you are. He could build a fire to chase away the cold and the damp. A fire would ease the ache in his hands, and he could warm the drum, turning it over and over until the heat pulled the hide tight against the wood frame. What about it, he said to the dog. Would you like a fire? On the far bluff above the beach, the motel star blinked pale blue. At one time, perhaps when the motel had been fresh and crisp, the neon sign had read, Ocean Star Motel, and Vacancy, and Welcome. But the damp fog and the corrupting salt air had made the sign undependable. He imagined that people strolling the solitude of the beach might find such a sign an irritating presence. But as he made his way across the sand, the four letters that remained seemed oddly reassuring, as though the old motel might mark a place of shelter and safety. He stopped and knelt. The sand was dark and fine, thick, more like clay. He picked up a handful and squeezed it as hard as he could. Then he set it down and watched as it slumped and melted away. Post hoc, he said to no one in particular, ergo propter hoc. Behind him, he could feel the sun roll out of the mountains like a bright wave. 
He touched the sand again and tried to remember which of the diving animals had brought up the first lump of earth. Muskrat, he told the dog, or maybe it was otter. He stepped into the lapping surf and waited. It would not be long now, and then the waters would part, the sand flat would rise out of the receding tide, wet and dark, like the hump of a massive sea creature, and the path to the lonely cluster of rocks in the distance would clear straight and narrow. The apostles. During much of the tidal cycle, they were little more than a low-lying cluster of bleak crags beaten by the waves. But when the moon turned to face the earth, the sea would pull back to reveal tall columns of basalt, smoothed and sharpened by wind and water, slanting into the sky and braced against the racing currents. The dog moaned and looked back to the high sand. It's okay, said the man. You don't have to come. At one time, the lower reaches of the apostles had been covered with orange starfish, black mussels, and purple urchins. Crimson crabs had scuttled in and out of the crevices and the cracks, and green sea anemones had fluttered against the rock like grass. But not now. Now all that remained of that community were the bleached bodies of barnacles still bound to the rock as they had been in life. It was impossible to avoid the brittle shells, and with each step they shattered under his feet. The rock itself was smooth and slick at first, but as the man climbed, the basalt turned ragged by degrees, scored with deep channels and razor flutes. Near the top, he found the narrow saddle, a tentative refuge, a place from which to watch the tide come in and cut off any escape. He had been here before, and each time he had retreated to the beach before the sea swallowed the rocks. Not this time. He turned towards the eastern mountains, angled the drum to catch the rising sun, and began a memorial song. But the elk skin was too soft now, too damp. The beat slid off, and his voice was drowned in the rushing water. In the distance, he could see the dog laid out on higher ground. And in that moment, in that moment, he thought about retreating once again. But the path back was only a memory now, all safety choked off as the sea ringed the apostles in ink and foam. He began the song anew, picking up the beat and raising the pitch so that his voice carried above the slicing surf. The sun was full in his face now, the sky blue and polished. It was going to be a good day. But as he turned back to the ocean to encourage the tide, the drum died in his hand. No. The fog had come out of nowhere. Dank and dark, its mouth gaping, it raced across the water and swallowed the dawn whole and complete. No, 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 no. He slumped against the side of the saddle. So this was how it was going to be. No sun, no blue sky, no last view of the forest and the mountains, just a wet abyss and the pounding thump of the waves. Wonderful. He had wanted sunshine, had no intention of dying in shadows. He had lived his life that way. He wasn't asking for much, a low tide so he could get to the rocks, a, a high tide so he couldn't get back, a little privacy and some light so he could see the world at the moment he left it. But here was that wizard fog again, and as he watched the trees and the mountains and the dog on the beach disappeared without a trace. Okay. No, son. So be it. If that's the way it was, so be it. He took off his jacket and laid it on the rocks, a soft cloth and leather jacket, black and tan, with crow fare stenciled across the back above a panorama of teepees with a banner that read, Powwow Capital of the World. It was a special jacket, strong and powerful, and even Sonny with his endless babble about salvage didn't bother him when he wore it. The photograph was in his shirt pocket. He didn't need to look at it again. He had looked at it countless times. He removed his glasses, stripped off the rest of his clothes, and took up the song once more, stronger this time, aiming his voice into the heart of the fog. But the breakers were having no truck with ceremony. They surged over the apostles and sent him sideways. The drum was soaking wet now. 
but it never sounded better. He had never sounded better. Maybe singing in the fog was like singing in the bathroom. Maybe the acoustics were always better in wet places. The rising tide tugged at him and tried to pull him in. Soon enough, he shouted, breaking off the song and wedging himself tighter into the rock. But not yet. And then he felt it. Something in the water touched him, grasped his leg for a moment and then was gone. A small fish probably or a piece of debris or maybe something larger, something looking for a meal. He pulled his feet further up the rock and watched the ocean roil below him. At first, at first he didn't see it, saw only the vague shadows of the running tide. And then there it was, a hand thrust out of the water and then an arm. Fragile, a slender branch caught in a flood, and then a pool of black hair floating around a child's face. He quickly shifted his weight and reached for the arm, just as a wave broke over his back and sent him sprawling, the salt rising in his nose and mouth like blood, the water burning his eyes. Two more waves broke against him before he found the child again, closer this time, almost at his feet. Hang on! He caught the arm awkwardly, his own shoulder twisting with a strain as he waited for the water to float the child closer to the rocks. And then he arched his back and pulled hard in one long motion. A young girl, thin as tin, cold and naked like him. It's okay. He gathered her in his arms so she wouldn't slip away. It, it's okay. He could feel her shaking and he wished he had something warm to wrap her in. But his clothes were gone, washed off the rocks, except for his jacket. It had been driven into a crevice. The leather was sopping and cold, but he draped it over her anyway, hoping it might provide some protection from the wind and the spray. He rocked the girl gently, trying to comfort her. It's okay. The waves came faster now, with hardly enough time between each surge to catch a breath. And in that moment, the girl turned and tried to break free, holding her arms out as though she wanted to return to the water. No, he said softly, pulling her back. No. She pushed away again, reached down into the foam, just as another wave slammed into the apostles and flung both of them sideways. Son of a bitch! The basalt cut into his shoulder and thigh, and he could feel the blood run warm on his skin. He had only one arm around the girl now, but as he struggled to retain the saddle, he saw a second body rise out of the swirling water. Stay here. He lifted the girl onto the saddle, forced her arms around the rock, and quickly slid down the side of the shaft, searching for a ledge he could stand on. Here, he shouted. I'm here. And suddenly the sea was alive with people. He caught a young boy by the hair and dragged him to the rocks. And then a young girl and an older woman. Another wave and an old man. Two young men, all naked and cold, their mouths filled with water, their eyes wild with life. Patiently, his arms and back in agony, he caught each one in turn until there were a dozen souls clinging to each other as the surf thundered around them. And then for no reason other than exhaustion and exhilaration, he began to sing again. Not the memorial song, a grass dance this time, a fierce song, a song for warriors. For now he knew these people. They were the sea people, the first people, the ones who had come from the ocean when the world was new, the long black hair, the fierce eyes. They had heard his song and they had come to be with him at his dying, or perhaps he had summoned them. Perhaps it was time for a new beginning. Perhaps it was time for the twins to walk the earth again and restore the balance that had been lost. He quickened the beat and imagined that the song alone had brought them forth, that his singing alone would hold the ocean back. And then very slowly, one voice at a time, beginning with the girl who had first reached out to him from the water, the people began to sing with him, their voices higher and sharper than his until the tide turned and the fog began to clear. But as the melting light revealed the shore and the trees, the sea people touched his hand in turn and slipped back into the calming water. 
He stayed on the saddle, and when the sun returned and the sky was high and cloudless, he waded to shore, watching the while for the young girl with the long black hair, hoping she would appear to greet him. But the only person waiting for him when he limped back to the beach was the dog. Now, of course, I'm hoping that you're asking yourself, what is this idiot doing? And who are these people? It's all here. <laughs> One of my favorite characters in the book is a man named Nicholas Crisp. Nicholas Crisp is, uh, has been in Samaritan Bay, oh, evidently since the beginning of time. He survived the disaster that's overtaken it. He looks after uh, hot springs, uh, uh, nine descending pools of different temperatures. And yes, if you know your Dante, then uh, you could make the jump. Um, but Crisp sort of looks after the place and uh, he takes care of anyone who gets washed ashore, as it were. And so he's, he's the one who uh, rents Gabriel a trailer when Gabriel first comes to Samaritan Bay. Because if you're going to try to kill yourself during the tidal cycles, you can't do it every day. There's high tides and low tides. They only come along every so often. And so Gabriel has rented a trailer. And this little piece I want to read is about him renting the trailer from Nicholas Crisp. You'll see why I like Nicholas. The trailer was an aluminum lump parked hard against a stand of Douglas fir and hemlock. It had been silver at one time, but the salt spray had skinned it gray. Gabriel wondered whether if you rubbed the sides, the genie might pop out. Flying cloud she be, Chris said as they walked around the trailer the next morning. Bath with a shower, stove, fridge, dinette, television, and selected videos and a bedroom with a view. You know trailers from trawlers? No, no, said Gabriel, I don't think I do. Nothing much to know. Simple they are. Not like a house. Now, there's a pox. A house, you see, don't want to move. Once she's built, she figures to stay put. A trailer's more compliant. You doesn't like where you come ashore? Well, just drop the hitch on the ball and away you go. Trailer's the better companion. Happy on the road and off. All love for you and your caprices and no complaining. Through the quartering fog, Gabriel could see a blue glow twinkling in the distance. Ocean Star Motel, said Crisp. The boy's poorly lit, but a sweet neighbor. He waved a hand over the water as though he expected the sea to part. The Apostles is good exercise at low tide if you've no aversion to climbing about on carcasses and bones. But watch your back. The sea is a shifty slut and she'll tide you in and slurp you up in a salty slurp. I, I, I'm not sure how long I'll stay. Ah, there's wisdom in that, enough for pants and shirts to fit us all. Chris ran a hand through his beard and it crackled and flashed in the pale light. Will you be needing a chair? <laughs> a chair? For the deck, said Crisp. So you can see, so you can sit and imagine to have some say in creation. Would you object to such an assembly? No, no, said Gabriel, a chair would be nice. Ah, and what'll it be? Crisp clasped, clapped his hands together. One for solitude, two for friendship, or three for society. <laughs> Gabriel tried to remember if Thoreau had had a pre preference. W one should be enough, he said. Then I'll do that. Nothing illustrious or imposing. Won't charge for the improvement, and I'll still give you the fugitive rate. <laughs> fugitive rate? Crisp stepped in close and lowered his voice. It came with the smell of garlic and wet wool. Folks used to come to the bay for all manner of reason. Vacations, festivals, family, friends. All that before the ruin, of course. Now most of what gets washed in this parcel of purgatory were a fugitive. Broadsided, blistered, and beached. It's, it, it's a fine trailer. Of course, it's impolite to ask a man what's disturbing his shadow, and sometimes the man don't know precisely what set him on the hurry. But when he gets here, when he gets here, he's clean out of run. For here be the land as we stand, and there be the water as we see. I'll, I'll, I'll take it, said Gabriel. Birds, said Chris, holding his arms out so that his coat caught the wind. We might have prospects for an escape if we were birds. Chris came by the next morning. If you must have a chair, a rocker's what's required. 
he said as he dropped the tailgate of his pickup. Like right in an ocean swell, resting safe in your mother's arms. You, you made this? We used to sit on the ground, said Crisp, and we used to walk on all fours. Well, th this is a really nice chair. And for all good truth will do us, we were happier then. Crisp walked to the edge of the deck. Have you a name somewhere about on your person? Gabriel nodded. Well, yes, several. A name for every occasion, said Crisp. The Indians do such a thing, I'm told. Collect names as they're earned or as they appear. In that, I'm a poor man, but with one name to drag about. Well, Nicholas is, Nicholas is a fine name. It covers a territory, it does. Saint Nick, Old Nick, Christmas and hell, and all the bleeding Nicks of life in between. Ga Gabriel, mostly I'm called Gabriel. Gabriel! Crisp's voice rushed through the trees like a truck in a tunnel. Now there's thunder and storm. The best loved of the four angels, the one chosen to announce the birth of John the Baptist and to reveal the Koran to Muhammad. It's Gabriel what tells Mary about the road ahead. Nicholas shook his head with delight. Dante made Gabriel the chief of the angelic guards placed at the entrance to paradise. Did you know that? And if the cre creative arts are your butter and jam, there's a movie called Constantine, which has a Gabriel who betrays heaven and joins forces with a dark lord. Crisp eyes flashed in the fading light and his lips curled away from yellowing teeth. And now at the meridian of the world on this seal, piss, and foggy dog of a day, here stands another Gabriel rigged for battle and havoc. It surely takes my breath away. I'm, I'm not that Gabriel. Yet here ye are, said Nicholas, grabbing Gabriel firmly by the shoulders. Here ye are. When you write, are you conscious of the voices in, in your head? Is it a very physical experience for you? Yeah, well, um, I've got a speech impediment, mm -hmm. and there are sound combinations that I, I can't say without stumbling mm -hmm. rather badly, as a matter of fact. I, I had that since I was a teenager, and over the years I've compensated for that. But the way I compensate is that I try to know what I'm going to say ahead of time, so if I see any danger there, that I can avoid it, I can change the word. Uh, so when I'm writing, uh, with everything that I write, I make sure that it has an oral component to it, that I hear it orally. So I read all my stuff out loud. Um, I mean, you, you, as a writer, you can read it in your head, but it, I think until you hear it out loud, you really don't know how it sounds. Right. And I tell my students that too. I say, you read this stuff out loud because you think it sounds really good on the page, and you sort of go through it, and you go, bump, 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 jump over the bad spots. But if you read it out loud, I make them stand right. up in class and read it out loud, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see them with their pencils making changes as they're right. reading the thing. So hearing it, hearing that oral performance, and you can hear it when you're reading, mm -hmm. I think. I think when a reader reads the book, if it's written in that manner, I think you, can, you have a better chance of hearing those voices. Right work for you. And is it easier or harder with someone like a Chris where the voice is so distinct, where he really stands out? Is it hard? I mean, with that, is it sort of like he just immediately arrives or are you building him? Chris was, uh, I, I had, I really had to, uh, I, I did about 15 or 16, 17 full drafts of this novel before it was done. It took me quite a while to write it. And I had to tone Chris down. Because I, I, I know, I see you're thinking, toned him down. But, but it's true, I really liked Nicholas Crisp, and uh, I had a really good time with him. But I, I had to rein him in because uh, he is an anomaly against the rest of the characters, and sometimes those kinds of characters can take over mm -hmm. a novel. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted there to be a balance there someplace. So mm -hmm. I, I had... Uh, Nicholas and I did not always see eye to eye on what should stay in the book and what should go. <laughs> There's another novel with him as the protagonist No, no, I can't, I can't, I can't do that again. I, I, I don't like to repeat myself. Uh, and Nicholas would be a hard guy to, yeah. you know, do again, right. I think. Right. I wanted to situate this because, as, as I said in the introduction, uh, this is your first literary novel in right. 15 years, but you are tremendously prolific. As a, as a creative force. Yeah, when, when, when I hear it's my first novel in 15 years, I think to myself, what have I been doing, sitting in my thumbs? And, <laughs> and then, then my partner, Helen Hoy, uh, pulls out my resume and says, no, you did this, you did this, you did this, you got this book, this book, this book, this one, this one, this one here. 
And it, it, while it's true that it's my first literary novel, mm -hmm. it certainly isn't my first book in that period. Well, because you write nonfiction, essays, uh, polemical pieces, you write children's books, myst a mystery series. Are, are the, are the, so in talking about this as a literary novel, are those boundaries really firm for you or? No, they're all, uh, all of those things, whether I'm taking photographs, whether I'm doing uh, genre mysteries, whether I'm doing children's books, whether I'm doing short stories, literary novels, film scripts, they're all forms of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is pay attention to the form mm -hmm. and then just sort of fit the story to that. So I know, for instance, if I'm doing a short story, I can't start off the same way I would a novel. If it's a children's piece, I have to pay attention to my audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so there all of those different, um, those different genres have a different, not, not rules so much, but expectations, I guess. Right. Right. So my, my love is, uh, is long form fiction. Mm -hmm. It just gives me more time to right. work with some of, the, some of the topics that I want to work with, some of the concerns that I want to talk about. Do you feel that you have more control, or, or is it I have easy? complete control. Complete control. <laughs> <laughs> which, right. which, is like, which is why I like being a writer, because until right. the book goes to my publisher, until it gets out into that larger world, you know, I have complete control on right. that. Right. I, I do love that. <laughs> Well, in this one in particular, I want I want to uh, dig in, and I know you talked a little bit about the. I mean, people have a uh, the the first part that, that that Tom read is the is the introduction, is the opening of the book, and it just gets better from there. I mean, it opens so powerfully, and it just continues to build like that. And um, you there, there's a theme of of twinning throughout the book, yeah. which is part of the 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 creation myth that the book takes its name from. Um, and in Gabriel, he he is to a certain degree twinned with Dorian Asher. Um, who is the CEO of the biochemical firm um, that was responsible for this disaster, this environmental disaster that happens. There's, there's a sense of those, th these two parallel stories mm -hmm. following along. What, did you think about those two characters right from the beginning? Yeah. Um, the way I like to write my stuff is I, I hate being prescriptive. Um, so that what I'll do is I'll set those ideas in motion. So, you know, uh, if there's a twin uh, theme in the book, then where do those twins occur? Mm -hmm. And you can find them in a number of spots, or you don't have to find them at all. Mm -hmm. uh, that way of reading the story is available to you but you don't have to use it particularly. So, I mean, what, what I've said over and over again about my writing is that I try to present a blueprint for the imagination. Right. So, uh, rather than tell you that this happened and this happened, and this is related to somebody, you know, kind of thing, mm -hmm. to where, you know, it's really locked down and there's no way for your imagination to imagine something mm -hmm. other than that, I try to just create this blueprint and say, you know, go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, have a good time. It's your book now. Once, as a writer, once the book leaves my hand, I've got no more control over it. Uh, readers do things with it. Uh, critics do things with it that I never would have thought they might right. do. Um, and I've got no control. I mean, it's sort of like a kid. You know, out the door, you know, have a good life. Uh, send me a postcard from time to time. Come up <laughs> by and visit. But how, I mean, given that you like the control you have. I love when, it. Then what is it like to let that go? Or is there, is there already another book, another project, another story coming along? Yeah, the good news is by the time a book actually leaves my hands and becomes a full-blown book, I, I don't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> but I sure as hell don't want to read it again. <laughs> You have to understand, I mean, I've, I've, I've read this thing uh, so many times, over and over again, to get the tone right, to get the words right, to get the rhythms right, to get the characters you know, lined up back and forth. I really don't care what happens to it. I've got another baby that I'm looking after that I'm creating. <laughs> now, with this one, unfortunately, I don't have another baby that I'm creating. I've sort of hit a a spot where I, I don't have something coming in hard on the heels of this. So I'm probably a bit more concerned about this particular child than I have been about my other ones. <laughs> but there's nothing you can do about it, so you might as well just you know, turn on the television set and have a beer. <laughs> 
Well, before we do that, let's get let's get back to this. Okay, I, I want to don't no no one go home and start drinking your beer yet. Um, so, uh, getting back to this idea of, of of the creation myth that sort of sort of in, in some ways forms the backbone of of the story. Two creation. Myths. Two creation myths. Um, in terms of the in terms of the indigenous creation myth of the of the of the of the the, the woman who fell from the sky yep. and lands on the back of the turtle and gives birth to twins, yep. um, there's the idea in the story of uh, uh, up against the Judeo Christian myth of the fall, mm -hmm. the the Eden, Eden and the fall and a, and a sin entering, um, that there there was perfection and then then sin came. Yep. Um, in the woman who fell from the sky story. Um, there's the balance right from the very beginning of the twin who creates order and the twin who creates chaos. The, uh, well, the two, the two stories, uh, they're not polar opposites, but it's interesting because in uh, the Christian story of creation, uh, you have a perfect world that collapses into chaos, and then you have to sort of pick up the pieces and go on. Uh, in, the, in the Iroquoian story of creation, I, I'm Cherokee, so that's, that's sort of my story, uh, or a story I have access to. The world start, starts off kind of chaotic. It's a water world without much form or anything, and you know people really don't know what to do, or the characters don't know what to do, the water animals. And, and slowly but surely, order is brought to that. Mm -hmm. And so you start off there with a world that's a chaotic world that becomes an orderly world. And that order is, 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 is put there not by a single deity or a single character, but it's put there by a community of characters. Okay, in the Judeo-Christian world, all that is handled by a single deity. You know, the Garden of Eden, out of the Garden of Eden, you know, there you go. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, 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 there, are, there are interesting correlations between the two. And I like to play with those. I like to, I like to look at that because those two stories help to create our notion of the world and our place in that world. Right, right. And they, but they also, they also reflect, I think, um, you know, I think that as people create origin stories, it's also a representation of who they are. I mean, the, the stories they create of their origins also speak to the values they have, the world they live in. Do you, do you agree with oh, that? Oh, sure. I mean, you, yeah. uh, these, all these stories are constructions that mm -hmm. we've, you know, that we've uh, put together to explain uh, those essential questions. Mm -hmm that we have. And if we didn't have those stories already, we would create them. Mm -hmm. If we wound up, you know, someplace on another planet with no memory of where we had come from, uh, one of the first things we would do is start working on some kind of a creation story. Mm -hmm. And it's not a question of whether the creation story is true or not true. It's a question of whether it's believed. Right. And if it's believed, then it's true. Right. And I guess also whether it makes sense to the people, like whether it... It, it has to. Yes, whether it fits into their, their sense yeah. of self, their sense of community. There's, there's no society that would create a creation story that doesn't make any sense to them. Right. <laughs> right. I don't think. <laughs> um, I, before, I, before I forget, when we were talking earlier, and I wanted to get to this before we get to other ideas, uh, can you tell me about the cover of the book? Oh, sure. This is a setup, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My... Uh, my, my partner is a painter, and uh, that's her painting on the cover of the book. And the interesting story is we were in New Zealand. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been to New Zealand, but we were in a place called Abel Tasman Park on the uh, north end of the South Island. Beautiful spot. If, uh, if you haven't been, are you looking for a vacation place, please. Uh, that's my recommendation. It's gorgeous. And we came to, we were walking on a trail, it was a hot day, we came to a, a kind of a lagoon in the ocean with all these rocks around it. And she decided she'd go for a swim. And we didn't have a suit. But whenever she sees water, she takes her clothes off, I have to say. <laughs> 65 years old and it doesn't stop her at all. And so, because I'm a photographer, I took a picture of her going into the water. And then when I got home, I uh, put the picture up on my computer and she came by and said, I like that, I'll, I'm gonna paint a picture of that. So I gave it to her and she painted the picture. And then when I went looking around for a cover, you know, a cover image for the book, uh, we had tried a couple of turtle paintings that she had done. I didn't like any of those. Uh, not least for this. I mean, I like her paintings. <laughs> I, I love her paintings. But I remembered this one, and I remembered the story of the woman who fell from the sky, which is a central uh, image in the book. And I said, well, let's use this. 
And so we did. So what I like to say when I go out into public is it's my face on the back and her mm. on the front. <laughs> and yes, she'll be happy to sign the book if you ask her. <laughs> she might get asked for more signatures. Then. She has, actually. <laughs> We always have dueling lines at the book signing table. You know, I might, might as well just sit her down next to me and just pass so the So it's going to be there. your behind on the next cover. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm the guy with the camera, remember? Right, right. Um, well, and again, I mean, get, I mean, in a way, it gets back to this idea of twin images of, you know, <laughs> one side and the other side. <laughs> one side and the other side. Front and back. Husband, yeah. wife. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can go there. <laughs> it wasn't me, Helen. It wasn't me. It was her. Um, and in so uh, people, I think people have a sense of of, of um, from from the reading if they haven't read the book yet, um, the kind of the kind of subjects you're you're dealing with here in terms of capitalism, environment, um, the the, tr the track and path we are we are on right now in the planet, um, and. Again, there are two parallel stories. One that could be quite sort of cynical about capacity to destroy mm -hmm. and to continue to destroy, and one about the capacity for resilience and renewal. Um, so you don't land on either side in this book. You allow both of those possibilities to exist. What I try to say in the book is, because I am concerned about this, uh, this uh, headlong plunge for wealth and uh, and really, it, it is a headlong plunge uh, for destroying the planet. Not in my lifetime, but uh, we could have some really serious disasters overtake us before I'm, I'm out of this world. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, what I can see are two different kinds of communities. One community is the kind that is in Samaritan Bay, where everybody is trying to get together again and re rebuild that town and rebuild that community. Uh, and one uh, that is typified by Dorian Asher, who is the CEO of Domidian, which is a community of one, where that one individual believes himself to be omnipotent and moves through the world as though no one else is there or no one else counts particularly. So you have those two that you can choose from in the book, that community of one and that community of many people working together. Now, you may like Dorian Asher's community. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't make him out to be uh, a, a, a big villain. He certainly has uh, villainous qualities, and he certainly makes some bad decisions in the piece. But it may be that uh, he's kind of a nice guy, actually. He shops too much. <laughs> yeah. Aside from making bad decisions about certain environmental things, you know, he shops too much. He, he likes to go to Harry Rosen's in uh, Toronto. He likes to, somebody knows Harry Rosen's here, <laughs> I can hear that. He likes to have fine watches. He likes to spend money on condominiums. Who doesn't? <laughs> Who doesn't? So he's not, you know, he's not the big bad wolf particularly, and that's what makes him, there's a kind of... Uh, I'll, I'll forget her name once again. There was a woman who talked about the banality of evil. Oh, Hannah Hanna Arendt. Thank you. Everybody knows except me, and I know <laughs> it. I can't remember it. But that, that sense of this banality of evil, and uh, Dorian in many ways is uh, someone, a character who typifies that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to um, circle back to the idea of community too, because another one of the, the sort of the plot lines in the book is, and I guess in, in, in a way another twinning in the book is with Gabriel and Mara, mm -hmm. who is a woman who is from the reserve in Samaritan Bay and left and has returned, and she's one of the, the survivors, uh, one of the one of the few survivors, and the only one still still there. Um, and there's, with, with both Gabriel and, and, and Mara, there is a, a sense of these are people who either had to leave their family or leave their community because their ambitions took them away. Yeah. Um, and in order to realize their ambitions, um, they, had to, they had to leave a community and then don't know how to come back to, to the reserve community or, in Gabriel's case, he never quite fits in. He's, he's Aboriginal, but he looks white. He never quite feels at ease in his own skin, uh, as much as he loves his family and, and loves you know, drumming and singing. I mean, there, there's, there's these lovely moments with him and his father. Um, so in thinking about the importance and role of community, um, what, what were you trying to get at in the book about, about Samaritan Bay representing the necessity or need for community? Well, you, you never know 
how important community is to you until you lose it, I think. And in Samaritan Bay, they've lost that and more. I mean, they really are starting off. Samaritan Bay is, I suppose, a kind of latter-day potential Garden of Eden. Uh, Mara and Gabriel are possibly a new Adam and Eve. Uh, I don't make that explicit whatsoever, but certainly was going on in my mind uh, at the time. And, you know, if that's true or any part of that is true, then, you know, how do you go about reestablishing a community? How do you go about reinventing a community? And in the book, uh, it's, uh, I was kind of happy w with the way in which I created that community or brought it back together again because it's, uh, it was sort of sly in a mm -hmm. couple of instances mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. So, and I'm not going to say any more thing mm -hmm. about it, give it away. <laughs> Well, and I'm, I'm going to open up to the audience in just one second, uh, but I was thinking about this with again with the, uh, the 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 you know the title, the back of the turtle, and there, there's a, there's there's a, a lovely moment when Gabriel's sister says to him, she sort of compares him to a turtle, mm -hmm. the idea that he has to carry his home around on his on his back, and sort of there, there's in some ways he's become this he's a really brilliant person, very gifted, yeah. and yet is alone. Um, and the sense of loneliness, the sense of he's self he's self sufficient, but he's the, you know everything is on him alone. Yeah. yeah. The the uh, one thing I should uh, there is a turtle in the book, by the way. It says the back of the turtle. There actually is a turtle in the book, but it, and there's a, and there's a dog. <laughs> in some of the uh, some of the uh, pre publicity uh, information that went out. He said, Thomas King's first novel in 15 years is blah, 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 this, that, this, that, this, that. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And there's a dog. <laughs> and there's a quick story about that dog because the dog wasn't going to be there. But I have a cousin named Joanne, a little younger than myself. And when I wrote Truth and Bright Water, if you know that book, there was a dog in that book named Soldier, as there is a dog in this book named Soldier. And at the end of Truth and Bright Water, Soldier goes off a bridge after another character and vanishes in the river and is thought to be dead at the end of the novel. And I sent a copy of that to my cousin, said, here's my new novel, Truth and Bright Water, hope you enjoy it. She wrote back and said, I like the book, but I will never forgive you for killing the dog. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And she says, you killed the dog, soldier. I love that dog. And I said, well, maybe he's not dead. <laughs> Maybe he went into the river and just, you know, swam ashore and went off. She says, no, he's dead. He's dead, and I will not forgive you. And so I said, oh, God, all right. So when I wrote this, I called her up and I said, okay, look, you know, I'm writing a new novel, and I'm bringing Soldier back. He's going to be in the book. Damn dog's going to be back in the book, so, you know, give me a break. And so I sent her a copy of this, and, but she had cataract surgery, and she hasn't been able to read it yet. So <laughs> she says, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to ask you about, and this is, this is the, perfect, uh, the perfect segue, is even though this is a book about um, an environmental disaster and it opens with this, this character that you, you, know, you, you care about very quickly attempting to kill himself, um, there's a lot of humor in the book. Um, which, is true of, which is true of your work. I mean, I, I think of everything of yours, whether it's fiction or non, your kids' books, every, I mean, there, there is always this, this um, whether it's a, a sly humor or more broad humor, that, that's always an element of what you do. Were you always funny as a kid? Were you always, were you a class clown kind of, was that, has that always been a part of your personality and a part of your creative I work? don't think so. I, I, there are a couple of things that happened to me. Uh, one, I'll try to make it quick. Um, I was a native activist in the 60s and 70s when I was at a school called Chico State in California. The schools in the states have all sorts of euphonious names. So I was at Chico State, which means little in Spanish, little state. And uh, there, was, uh, there was no Indian organization on campus, and so a Mohawk guy and I and an anthropology professor put one together. And at one point, we were asked to be on a panel with a couple of BIA guys, Bureau of Indian Affairs officials. And we had you know, headbands, and we were pretty noisy. And I was angry about the treatment that Native people had been afforded by the US government. And uh, I was going to do something about it. Uh, I was probably 20-something. 
And so we got on the panel with uh, the two people from the BIA, and uh, Rick and I, you know, just had this hell raising speech. Pretty good, too. I wasn't bad. <laughs> and I was large, even larger than I am now. And so when we finished, we came off the stage, and as we came off the stage, the two, the two BIA, BIA guys in fr were in front of us, and the woman who had organized it shook their hands and handed them an envelope. Shook their hands, handed them an envelope. Well, I'm not stupid. I knew what it was. It was on rarium. And so we came off the stage, and I shook her hand and waited for the envelope, and uh, I didn't get one. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, you know, what was in the envelope you gave those guys? And she says, oh, well, that was an honorarium. And I says, well, where's our honorarium? And she says, she was kind of embarrassed. And she says, well, c come on. They're the experts. <laughs> and I said, I said, what are we, the mm -mm -mm entertainment? <laughs> and I realized at that point that's what I was. I was the entertainment, that I had taken a very serious matter and I had handled it with all seriousness, and it had just died. Mm. I was entertainment, watched the angry Indian, he dances, he shouts, he jumps around. And I realized, not right away, but soon afterwards, that if you're going to deal with serious issues, you better be willing to deal with them with humor in some ways. You better be able to, because humor s sharpens the pathos. It really does. Mm -hmm. And so if you watch me work humor into a novel, then you can pretty much figure that I'm dealing with a very serious issue. It's the only way to get past the defenses of the reader. People who just see you know, wave after wave of tragedy washing onto their shore actually will turn away and walk back up the beach to higher sand. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you lure them in is you get them chuckling, and then they sort of say, oh, God, what, was, what, what am I laughing at? <laughs> Why is that funny? And it's too late. <laughs> too late by then. Way too late. I want to open up. We have about 15 minutes for a Q&A. And I see right in the center a gentleman in the plaid shirt. If someone could, if you could make your way to someone with a mic or they could pass it your way. Would you just tell the people who are here and don't know about the Dead Dog Cafe what it was? I, uh, d the Dead Dog Cafe was a radio show that I did for about 10 years running off and on on CBC. It was, we pretended it was an hour. It was called the Dead Dog Cafe Comedy Hour, and it was only 15 minutes. <laughs> but at the seven and a half minute mark, we would say, in the second half hour <laughs> on our show, but it was just uh, three uh, native voices uh, doing uh, skit comedy, fairly serious skit comedy from time to time. And, is is uh, it archived? It, can someone find it on the CBC website, do you know? You probably can still. Yeah. You can find some of it on YouTube. Terrific. OK, great. Yeah. The, thing, the thing I liked best about the show, for the, first for the first and only time in my life, somebody paid me to bitch about the things that I disliked. <laughs> I actually got paid to do that. And I also got to talk about uh, native issues on national uh, public radio in a way that I think hadn't been talked about before. I may be wrong about that, but uh, it was, and it was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it was fantastic. Floyd, <laughs> oh, thank you. I want to um, see, yes, there's another question right here. Good evening. As uh, you were speaking towards the end of the, uh, the story, you said the only person standing uh, on, a, on the beach was a dog. Yeah. Uh, can you explain that? Well, the dog, uh, the dog from Truth and Bright Water, the novel that my cousin liked, but I supposedly killed that dog, what I did was, the idea was he floated out to sea and then came back onto the beach at Samaritan Bay, and so he's there with the rest of the characters. And that particular dog, uh, dogs can be messengers. In some native stories, they're messengers. They'll warn uh, camps about something that's gone wrong. They can give advice. And so that's what this dog does in the story. Actually, the dog is the one who gives, soldier is the one who gives the warning just before the environmental disaster hits. Soldier is the one who looks after Gabriel when Gabriel's trying to kill himself and trying to put his life back together again. And it's, uh, it's Soldier who also looks after another character named Sonny, 
who's a very kind of lonely boy who looks after a motel by himself, kind of strange character. So that's why the dog is on the beach. And the, but the dog isn't silly enough to go off on the rocks with Gabriel. You know, if the guy wants to kill himself, well, the dog can't stop him. So, you know, he'll watch and keep track in case the guy needs advice. <laughs> but aside from that, you know, he's there to help, but not to get in the way. You know, he's not going to tell him what he has to do. He's going to, he's going to be there in case he needs to present some of the possibilities of some of the characters. Well, I'm impressed with your marketing skills, so I will go out and buy the book. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> There's a question over on this side. Hot dog. Hi. Hi. My name is uh, Corley Powderface, and in regards to the comment from the first gentleman, I do come from the Morley Reserve, and Thomas, I'm going to try, try really hard and push the name Dead Dog Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So what I want to see is across the top, stay calm, be brave, wait for the science. All right? I'll keep that in mind as well. Thank you. And I really like the fact that you've put spirituality in, the, in your book. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for about two more questions. Are there any other? Yes, back there. And then we'll go to this side, if there's somebody over on that side. I was rereading uh, the opening to Inconvenient Indian before ah. I got here tonight. And I loved your conversation with yourself about fiction versus history and how much of what lives in the other. And so I just wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more to that because I, I, like, the, I like the place where it lands and I'm fascinated that you've now gone back into so-called fiction, but you know yeah. where this goes. Yeah. Uh, basically, people ask me, because I write fiction and nonfiction, how do you keep the two straight? And I don't. <laughs> we all like to draw a line between fiction and nonfiction, but the truth of the matter is there is no line. I could point you to just the political arena <laughs> to demonstrate that. Those guys haven't seen that line for centuries. <laughs> and I, I don't think in storytelling that, you know, you really need to have that line because, uh, you know, if I'm playing with fiction, then I bring history into it and I play with history. And if I'm playing with, with what's called nonfiction, then I bring at least fictional strategies to the storytelling. And besides, if you've read all the great historians, uh, you know, the early uh, historians of the 19th century, uh, the 20, early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, these guys would have, uh, let's say, uh, 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 Francis Parkman, would have conversations that native leaders would have at a meeting. Well, he wasn't there. He has no idea what they said. There may be a letter or two, but what he does is, as a writer, he tries to reconstruct what he thinks went on. So is that history or is that fiction? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's storytelling. And that's really what I, how I look at it. You know, Storytelling is storytelling, whether you're working in uh, what we call nonfiction, whether you're working in fiction, uh, whether you want to merge those two. There, there's a... There's a, a a newish genre called creative nonfiction, which is a way of saying, okay, forget the line. <laughs> Matter of fact, the Inconvenient Indian was up for a number of awards in creative nonfiction. One last question over here. Is there, is there somebody over here waiting? No? Over on this side, any, any last takers? Yes, right there. Oh, she's got Hi, one King. of my books, too. Uh, two of them. Are you kidding? Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll try to make this condensed. With your new book, which I haven't read yet, but I'm looking forward to it, uh, you've mentioned that there's the levels of hell and all the rest of it. How accessible is it going to be to new writers or new uh, readers, pardon me, who don't have that background? That's a good question. Uh, 
when I write my books, I try to write them in levels. So you can work at any level you want to. So if you just come in for a good story, okay, it's there. Uh, think of Moby Dick. You could go to Moby Dick. How about, you all know Moby Dick, don't you, more or less, even if you haven't read it? You've heard it so many times, you think you know it. It's okay. You can read Moby Dick as a whaling adventure story. Or you can, or you can read it as a commentary on the world that Melville saw. And so there's layers that you can read at. So, for instance, in this book, if you don't know uh, uh, Dante and his uh, Seven Circles of Hell, uh, then it's okay. The hot springs are still a kind of creepy place to go to. <laughs> so there are different levels that different readers will read at. There's Latin in this book, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you don't know what the Latin word means, it's no big deal. If you do, maybe it's a bit more fun. So it's not, you know, sort of stupid level, smarter level, really smart, <laughs> intelligent, brilliant kind of thing. It's just, it, it's, it's, like, it's like swimming in water. And you can do whatever you want and just take your own path through the book. And you get out of what you get out of it. I mean, I can't tell one reader th that they're going to read the same way another reader is going to read. What I hope is that you enjoy the read that you make for yourself. And if you do that, then I'm perfectly happy. I'm not trying to stump you. Um, but you can figure that if something looks a little bit weird, it probably is in the book. If you think, I wonder what he meant by that. You're probably right. He did mean something by that. But I, I hope it, it flows as a good read, no matter what level uh, at which you read this thing. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Thomas King. What a wonderful, I feel like we could go on for hours, but I need to wrap this up. Um, but you can, if you haven't bought a copy of the new book, um, The Back of the Turtle, and I think other, your previous books are on sale as well, um, and you'll be signing out in the lobby. Where? Um, out there. We'll get you There's there. There's a lobby. <laughs> There's a lobby. We'll get you there. Um, and your partner will be signing the books as well. Yeah, out if, there. You want, yes. if, you want, if you want her to sign her butt, you can... <laughs> You might need to find another place to sleep tonight after, <laughs> after this. Um, thank you to everyone here at the BAMP Center and at WordFest for making this happen. Thank you to Thomas King. Thank you to you in the audience. Um, tremendous questions. Um, and again, thank you for the great conversation. Pleasure. Thank you.